Yeah, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Prashant Kumar. Uh, I'm an engineer at Mainz AI, based out of uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and talk about our platform, RL platform called DeepSim, and an exciting uh, use case where we use RL-based uh, intelligent wind farm control. So uh, about MindSci, we are a funded startup with about 25 people scattered around the globe, US, uh, Netherlands, and India. Uh, we specialize in the deployment of RL-based uh, solution at an enterprise level, and we have worked with a number of Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies in the past. And uh, we, our RL solutions are built using DeepSim. DeepSim is our pl flexim platform, which allows which is a simple to use platform for uh, domain experts who want to uh, take advantage of RL. And DeepSim itself is built on top of Raystack. So our user get access to all the uh, features and capabilities that Raystack has to offer in a simple to use uh, fashion. Uh, so I will go into the detail of how DeepSim is built on, on top of uh, Raystack uh, in the first part of the slide. And lastly, uh, uh, last year we did a project with Microsoft and Vestas. Vestas is one of the largest uh, manufacturers of wind turbines, and where we successfully demonstrated that we can improve the efficiency of their wind farms. And for, for that, we got um, a Microsoft Partner Award of, for 2022 for enabling sustainability. So, uh, so since our inception, we have worked on a number of use cases, uh, ranging from fab scheduling, which is optimizing semiconductor manufacturing, uh, optimizing wind farms, flight plot pl planning, driving assistance system, et cetera. And the learnings that we had in these projects have helped us define how DeepSim is now. And uh, DeepSim, we, uh, we, we designed DeepSim keeping in mind that domain experts who are good at part particular subject matter, they should spend more time iterating through the agents rather than learning all these advanced libraries like uh, Ray, TensorFlow, et cetera. So uh, now, we have narrowed down our focus to these two fields because uh, these two fields are, involve highly complex system, and decisions have to be made on a uh, on uncertain environment. Uh, the state space is really large, uh, and also the objectives that you want to optimize for are always competing. So many conventional optimization approaches don't work very well in this case. So we believe that uh, RL has a lot to offer in this area. So now let's dive into DeepSim. So as I mentioned, DeepSim is a platform designed for, uh, it's a simple to use platform designed for domain experts who want to leverage all the features that Raystack has to offer. And uh, the, uh, like experts who want to iterate more over the agent rather than learning how to do cluster management and how to code in TensorFlow, for instance, just a minimal knowledge of Python would suffice to train your own agent. So uh, this is how our product stack look. Like we have two product, MindSight Flow, which is to optimize your renewable resources like wind farm or solar, solar farm, and Mi MindSight Maestro, which is to optimize your semiconductor manufacturing facility, uh, facilities like uh, optimizing schedule of how you want to manufacture semiconductors in, in your factory. These two products are built on top of DeepSim, so you don't have to directly interact with DeepSim when you're using Flow or Maestro, but uh, end users can also directly license DeepSim to build their own RL solution. And DeepSim, has this three components, like uh, the, the most important part is we use all the proven open source software such as Ray, TF, MLflow, uh, Apache Airflow, et cetera, th th that are the, co the core components of DeepSim, and on top of which we have put our own toolings to, uh, for data processing, uh, new RL algorithms that are not available with RLlib, and then some cloud services. And everything, all of these uh, training runs can be deployed on uh, scalable compute infrastructure. Once you have your agent on the deployment side, we also have uh, deployment optimization. So depending on what kind of in infrastructure you want to put your agent, uh, we allow that kind of uh, uh, optimization. So, uh, so we have a very simple uh, front end for DeepSim, which could be just a Python or command line based uh, tool. And from this, uh, this front end, user can integrate the simulator environment uh, they can add custom login to log certain metrics from their environment while the training is running. Uh, they can choose uh, what kind of training libraries they want to use under Ray lib. Cluster management, so how many cores they want to dedicate for training. 
how much memory, uh, storage, et cetera. And also, uh, they can choose parameters for hyperparameter optimization. And NAS, which is a neural architecture search, so they can search over a wide range of architectures available with this library. And finally, do data visualization and analytics while training and also after the training is finished as post-processing step. And they can choose what kind of backend they want to deploy, SEO, GCP, on-prem. And uh, also, we, DeepSim allows you to do training on Windows-based system, which is quite rare, but a lot of enterprises are based on Windows system. So this is a feature that uh, is also quite used with our customers. Uh, so this is a complete stack of DeepSim plus Ray. So all the blue components are the, uh, the Ray-based component. And then around this, we have built some extra features to uh, just based on our customer requests. So for example, custom explore function, we have a behavior transfer, random entropy for improved exploration. Uh, easy way to define a model. So uh, just based on text description, you can give what kind of neural network you want to define, and then it converts into TensorFlow or PyTorch-based model. Custom login. So RLib already has login built in, but uh, if the user wants to also log metrics from the environment or KPIs, how it's improving during the training, it could be done from there. Uh, CAT, quant uh, quantize aware training, and NAS. Uh, so uh, custom action distribution. So there are some action distribution that uh, we want for a particular uh, application, but it's not available with RLib. So we have added some of the, some of those. Easy way to do inference. So uh, we can just use one command to do inference. So j uh, we have abstracted out a lot of features that makes it easy to use DeepSim, and uh, just uh, on just few lines in, in uh, of code would do stuff that you need to like do more using, uh, for example, race or so those kinds of so just simplified it, simplified workflow for people who are not very experienced with uh, the Ray stack. So uh, the workflow is quite simple. Like user first configure the simulation environment, connects it, uh, uh, like connect the simulator with RLIV, defines a, a reward function, defines all the custom login, chooses what kind of hyperparameter tuning uh, they want, and NAS, for instance. And then all this configuration, all these settings is sent to uh, a run management system, which converts this into settings that could be run using Tune. And then once all the uh, Tune runs are configured, it is sent to the scalable array cluster, the backend. So once the training, uh, then the training starts. And then once the training is running, you can connect it to uh, TensorBoard or MLflow to monitor your training, maybe run a couple of more trainings, uh, depending on how this goes. And then finally, when the tra training is done, you get you can export the model as a RLIF checkpoint. So, so this big, this brings to the final part. Uh, once you have the trained agent, the deployment depends on uh, the application, and also what kind of hardware you want to deploy. So, for example, in manufacturing setting, the latency is not a big issue, so you can use Razor to just serve your uh, trained model. But on the other hand, there are applications where uh, you need high latency from your model. For example, uh, uh, when you are planning fl flight path for drones, where you need to implement uh, collision avoidance uh, inference. So in that case, you need, we optimize uh, RL agent using Onyx or Tensor, Tensor RT. And then finally, there are situations when, uh, where the, the workstation or the laptop is not connected to the internet. For example, in power, power plants due to uh, this regulatory requirement. So in, this, in that case, you can directly deploy on these standalone uh, hardware, and then that would control your power, power plant without being connected to the internet. Uh, so, so now I've shown all the three aspects, like conf configuring, training, as well as deployment using DeepSim. So now let's uh, jump to the wind farm project. So th this is a project that we did with Microsoft and Vestas last year. Uh, and the demo that I'm going to show is based on open source data, as we cannot uh, show the real uh, uh, farm that we use in our case, but it, just to demonstrate the idea. So, uh, so why wind? Because uh, wind is one of the fastest growing uh, renewable energy sector, about 800 gigawatts of electricity. So like 6% six, six of the electricity today comes from wind farms. and and one of the main challenges with wind energy is that 
the number of amount of dollar spent per megawatt is really high compared to other sources of energy. And partly, this is partly due to the way wind farms are controlled today. So uh, a lot of wind farms are controlled on heuristic-based control algorithms, which, for example, every turbine tracks, tracks the local direction of the wind. And in this case, uh, they don't take into account all this complex aerodynamical interaction between the turbines, fluid dynamic aspect of it. So, so because of that, uh, today, modern, even modern day wind farms, they suffer from efficiency loss. And, and uh, RL can help a lot in improving the uh, productivity of these wind farms. So, so uh, we can have multiple objectives that RL can optimize. Like the most obvious one is optimizing the power production, but it can also be optimizing the mechanical load because turbines operate under very turbulence conditions. So you can control it in such a way that uh, there's uh, the, the turbulent wind is steered away from the turbines and it could reduce the maintenance cost. Uh, another interesting application is compliance with grid. So as you know, grid needs supply and demand balance, right? So in some cases, you would like to reduce the power from the wind farm so that because there's already a lot of power flowing into the grid and you want to balance it out by re re reducing the power. So it's kind of competing objective from the first uh, uh, objective where you want to maximize the power, but uh, in, in, it's in re realistic case, it happens a lot, especially in Europe, where there's too much power and the grid is overloaded with power and there's less uh, consumption. And finally, the fourth uh, thing is noise. So if you live around wind, uh, windmill, there's a lot of noise and there are strategies which can be used to reduce the no noise and make it more uh, favorable for people who live around this uh, wind wind farms. So, uh, so wake effect. Wake effect is one of the major causes of uh, efficiency loss on the wind farm. So on the right, you see one of the very uh, famous wind farm in Denmark, which is called Hans, Hansreb. And uh, in wake effect, what happens, like the front turbine blocks the uh, inflow of the wind, and the turbine at the back receives less powerful turbulent wind. So in the white, the clouds you see is it's called wake, wake clouds, and this is highly turbulent. So the energy produced by the turbine, which is from the second row onwards, is, is very less compared to the front row turbine. And usually, uh, this, this effect can reduce power up to 20% uh, on a daily basis. So it's one of the largest causes of why, uh, uh, why wind farm produces less. And turbulence also accelerates structural degradation of the turbines, So which means that there would be higher maintenance cost, and also uh, the lifetime of your wind farm will go down. So uh, we tried, uh, we, we trained a RL agent that reduces this wake effect by doing something called wake steering. So in wake steering, you basically uh, rotate the, the front row turbine on a vertical axis by some angles. It's this, this process is called yawing. And what it, what it does is it steers away the wake that is being built, uh, uh, that is being built. So I don't know if it's visible, but it's in the light gray, if you can see. And so, so th if you do wake steering, uh, the wind turbine that is located behind gets also uh, uh, the fresh wind, which has no, no turbulence in it, compared to uh, uh, without any yawing. And this is the control aspect of RL. So RL wants, uh, with RL, we want to do this perfectly. And this is difficult because wind is very dynamic. It changes every 10 minutes or so, sometimes the gust of wind. So the agent needs to learn the, dy the wind dynamics of that area. And also, if you do this yawing, the production of the front turbine goes less, but the production of the turbine that is behind goes up. So there has to be a balance that, uh, because you, uh, like if you want to have, you want to reduce the wake in such a way that the enti entire out output of the farm goes up, even though the output of this front row turbine is, uh, becomes less because there are a lot of turbines behind it and they are producing more. So effectively, the wind farm produces more. So these are some of the challenges that agents needs to uh, learn. And yes, yeah, so how do we make a controller out of it? So we use MindSight flow. Uh, the first task is to, to uh, 
to integrate the simulator with Mindsight Flow, and every company has their own propriety wake model, which is a fluid dynamic solver, which solves some form of Navier-Stokes equation. And these simulators are usually very expensive, uh, like each run takes like hours to complete. And then other forms, forms of data that you need are uh, like histor historical data for sites. So you want to know like over many years, how was the wind in that area, maybe a resolution of 10 minutes or so. Uh, like wind characteristic, density, air pres uh, pressure, temperature, et cetera. And you also want to know the layout of the wind farm. So how many wind, farms are, uh, wind turbines are there in a wind farm? What is the height of these wind farms, the radius, the diameter, et cetera? And also the constraint that needs to be uh, in place because uh, there, there, is, there are a lot of constraints of how you wa want to steer realistically to, uh, in order to not uh, cause any structural damage. And finally, uh, to code your rewards, you also need uh, a baseline. So baseline would be how currently the wind farms are managed. So one, like, a very common way to do is just do local tracking. So each turbine would just follow the wind that is directly following locally to it, so parallel to the wind direction. Uh, or there could be some very uh, heuristic-based lookup table where, they will, uh, where the turbine will look at the, the conditions, the observations, and then look at the lookup table, and based on that, derive the action. So these are the two possibilities that are in practice today. And agent has to beat this baseline, too, so improve over this baseline. And, and uh, one thing I want to uh, point out here that uh, we use RLIPS uh, multi-agent training. So because each turbine is modeled as a single independent agent, but they share the same policy, maybe different experience, but the same policy. So, so this way you get more data per uh, simulator run. So for example, if you have 50 turbines in a wind farm, then you will get 50 rows of data. So the training is much more faster, and you have to run less number of times your simulator. So uh, yeah, so let's see a demo. Uh, in, this, in this picture on the left is a uh, top view of a wind farm. And all these black dots are, uh, by, by the way, this is an actual US wind farm with around 50 wind farms. And all these dots represent uh, a wind farm. And in front of it is an arrow pointing in the direction of the wind. And what you see behind is a wake, which looks like a flame, but it's slower wind. The controls are actually wind speed. And on the right, you see on the top is a power improvement over the baseline. So everything above zero is the improved power that, that you get from the uh, RL agent. And uh, three colors, red, blue, green, are, are actually the three turbines that we are tracking for this uh, visualization. And uh, yeah, let me play it again. Yeah. So, so what we are seeing here is on the right side is the power improvement, and at the right bottom is the yaw. So it's the action that agent took for these through these three turbines. So you can see that on a high wake like this, there is a huge power gain, and then when there is no wake buildup, the agent learns to behave as a baseline strategy. So and also in the in the with the dotted line on top of it, you you can see the farm level improvement, which goes up to around 6%. six percent. And this is one day simulation. So the agent is uh, taking action every 10 minutes. And this is how the profile looks over the day where this controller is running on the field. Uh, so, so last thing we do is like we let this uh, agent do inference for two years worth of data. So in this case, from 2013 to 2015. And this is how the, uh, this is how the improvement AEP and annual energy uh, percentage gain looks like. So on an average, uh, it gains about 1.2% over the baseline for, uh, for two years of time. And you see a cyclic behavior. So like there are months where agent uh, pr uh, produces higher gain because probably in those months, winds direction are really unfavorable for the wind farm. And and you can get more out of the agent. And for some time of the month, you see uh, less gain. And this is a cyclic behavior. So from 2013 and 2014, you see like a similar, uh, similar uh, cycle. So, 
so yeah, th th this is how the agent profile looks when it's uh, uh, when it does inference over like a long period of time. Uh, so so this is only AAP gain. Agent also improves in terms of uh, like damage that is happening due to turbulence effect that is being mitigated now. So there are two uh, benefits of using this agent. Uh, yeah. So so. So I want to close with a statement like the agent that we build is very generic. It could be, you can use it on any wind farm in the world. You can just uh, convert it into your, uh, add it to your PID controller and you would get some improvement over the baseline. So suppose you are designing a new wind farm and, and designing a new farm, uh, wind farm requires you to do a lot of iterations like you generate thousands of different uh, proposals of layout and then you you evaluate whether it's gonna be a profitable venture for the next 20, 20, 25 years. And you can use this tool to do that iteration and see how wake steering would benefit you over those big time frame. So that, that's one other application that you can do with this uh, RL agent. So yeah, uh, that was all. Uh, if you have any questions. Also feel free to connect if you have any more questions later. Thank you. Uh, sorry, maybe you mentioned this earlier, but uh, perhaps you can expand on it. What does what advantage would a reinforcement learning approach have over a traditional PID in controller in controls? Uh, yeah, so uh, traditional PID control just tracks the local wind direction, so it's always going to be parallel to the wind that is coming. But in this case, uh, the RL agent try to make the turbine. Uh, at some angle with the with the in, incoming flow, so that the wake is not directly going back to the turbine, which is in the back row of it. So, so all the PID agent that are now used uses this very simple strategy where you just have like a, the the turbine facing parallel to the coming incoming direction. But now the agent does some angle. It learns how how much to steer a bit, so that like the turbine behind it also produces more electricity. So that's the main difference. Um, have you have you had a chance to investigate um, wind for wind farms in a different topology rather than a uh, flat surface? Like, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> so when we work with our client, like. They have their fluid dynamic model that has the terrain information as well, and it's it's just a contour. So if it's higher than the turbulence buildup is very different. So in our actual project, we actually use a realistic model that has a, a real simulator that has high fidelity information about that terrain as well. So yeah, this is this is on a, based on a simpler simulator, but the real simulator is much more uh, uh, sophisticated in terms of modeling those uh, physical conditions. Hi, so you said you use uh, like historic data about the wind conditions of that area and stuff. Yeah. So do you like use like offline data as well as like simulator data to train the agent or how do you combine the two? If yeah, so training is entirely done on offline data. And uh, so we get like at uh, spatial temporal, at some res resolution we get this wind information in three dimension for example and then we throw it into the simulator and basically, for a certain angle, the fluid dynamics of the entire area changes. So we start with an input as in like the wind direction that you get from meteorology, and then we throw it into a simulator, and that becomes the actual observation of the environment, uh, of the agent. Uh, how, because, because moving the turbine changes the fluid dynamics of the entire system, right? Mm -hmm. And that is, yeah. goes, but we use realistic site data that we can get as, as uh, fine as possible.
Uh, I know that you mentioned briefly that the agents are learning in a multi-agent way. Yeah. Uh, what, if any, information are they communicating with each other? Are they just able to observe each other's states, or are they totally independent while they're learning? Uh, yeah, so so there are two parts of the training. So first part is like every every turbine is a single agent, and it knows the static information about its neighbors. So it knows that there are five turbines in this direction, two in this. So this is static information, and then it sees its own lo local wind condition. And so, for example, every, at every moment, all the 50 turbines in this would have similar uh, like features, but it would be different experiences because of the location they, they are located in. So, so in that sense, and then, then with this, you get quite a decent agent, but what you would like to do is overfit on a particular location because you have more information. So each turbine, you can provide the entire information for the entire wind farm of all the 50 turbines. So we do this in, in a way because we want a generic wind farm that we can use even on a random layout before, uh, so for example, in case of layout optimization, where you want to design a layout. But if we already have an existing wind farm, then we try to overfit it on that turbine's information. So in that case, it's multi-agent, but the data, like every agent gets entire wind farm data because we already know that the, this wind farm already exists. So yeah. OK, thank you. So you mentioned that you use a simulator for training. Yeah. Um, I would like to know, are you using like an episodic setting there, such that one episode is one year? And, uh, um, yeah. Then it would also be interesting, how many episodes do you have to train your agents until you get a convergence? How expensive is that? Yeah. So it's episodic. It's daily, epi uh, d uh, like every episode run for a day. And, and every day has like uh, every 10 minute resolution data for wind. Because uh, the constraint that we have is like, this, these are big structure and we can only move like few degrees every minute. So the, the wind resolution should also have very similar resolution of how much it could move. In, so in this case, we use 10 minute resolution and amount of time was around seven years for training. And then, so we just look few years back and then uh, do inference in the most recent years. So yeah like seven years of data in this case. Uh, one question I have is um, uh, what kinds of tools do you use to manage the GCP and Azure infrastructure for the service? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's Terraform, but I'm not a solution architect, maybe I could ask him, but I think it's the Terraform for Managing uh, Kubernetes. Oh, cool. Ah, got it. 